And then on the fiber side, I think there's a lot of opportunity on, on the fiber side, but with fiber, I think we just need to start putting, you know, breaking it down to more being more nuanced for horses for courses or age of the pig and rather just using it as a blanket. And then the whole satiety satiation aspect that's very good for sows. And the reason why we want to use it for sows or gilt is, is probably the opposite reason for what we want to use it for grow finished pigs. And we got to think about it differently. Welcome to another episode of the Swine It Podcast Show. I'm your host, Trey Kellner, and today I'm excited to be joined by one of uh, my mentors and now colleagues, uh, Dr. Nick Gabler, who's the John F. Patience Endowed Professor in Swine Nutrition at Iowa State University. Nick, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Trey. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be back here and be able to talk about research and other things that's going on in the swine industry. So thank you for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Nick, why don't you introduce yourself to our, to our listeners? Yeah, so um, originally grew up in Australia, been over in the US for nearly 20 years now, but um, started off by doing some postdoctoral research at Purdue University, then moved to Iowa State back in about 2005, and joined the faculty in the Animal Science Department in 2008, and have gone through the um, 10-year promotion process, and yeah, now I'm a yeah, full professor in swine nutrition at Iowa State University. Um, yeah, and also the inaugural John F. Patient Endowed Professor in Swine Nutrition. And so I've um, been very grateful to have that position. And yeah, John, like like you said, um, yeah, I was on your on your research committee for your PhD, but John Patience has been one of my um, one of my big mentors in my academic career. And so yeah, I'm just glad to continue on his legacy. An animal nutrition technology company offering innovative products and new applications for the swine industry. The combination of AB Vista enzymes, technical services, and nutrition expertise provides the industry with new opportunities to further improve production efficiencies. Fiber is receiving renewed interest due to its influence on the microbiome, and AB Vista has brought together research experts to discuss the industry's knowledge of fiber functionality and to introduce a stimbiotic targeted to improve fiber digestion. To request access, contact NAM at abvista.com. That's N-A-M at abvista.com. Yeah, and as a former, you know, patient student, a very worthy recipient as well, Nick. Um, so let's, let's kind of start big picture, and we're going to hop around a bit um, because your research area and um, your, your focus right now is, is very busy. You have a full plate, right? So we're going to start first on fiber um, and what you found in characterizing, you know, what works and what might not work, maybe even more importantly, um, with utilizing fiber in our, you know, starter diets and our nursery diets. So Nick, maybe start big picture um, on what you found so far and where you're heading and we can dive in deeper from there. Yeah, um, so really, um, it's like a lot of my areas of nutrition. I'd never, I said I'd never do amino acid work. I ended up doing amino acid work, and I said I'd never do fiber work, and now I'm doing some fiber work. But um, really, my interest in fiber is really stemmed around the fact that um, it's more from an enteric health standpoint. So we hear a lot in the literature, and also a lot on advertisements, and and you know, all through the media that you know, fiber, functional fiber, fiber is great for gut health and so forth, and so. Really, what we've been trying to do is actually explore that under commercial conditions, or at least under commercial and um, enteric health conditions. And so, is there a role for fiber within swine nutrition in practical diets that can help improve intestinal health and integrity and function, and also just help with peak performance? And um, we've done some work with um, with fiber. We'll call it loosely right now, uh, anywhere from a weaned pig all the way through to some finishing pigs. And um, a lot of that stuff is really going to depend on the type of fiber that's used, um, also the age of the pig, and more importantly, the type of enteric health challenge um, that that pig is exposed to. And, and it's whether we're seeing where, um, whether we see we get results or not with regard to either improved performance or, or reduced antibiotic use, livability, et cetera. It's a, it's a lot of nuances within it, and I think this is one of the – challenges of fiber research, um, especially when it comes to enteric health, that's not one size fits all. And we've got to stop thinking about fiber and in, in very generic categories that improves gut health. And it's the 
the be all to end all because I think it's more nuanced than that. And so improving uh, the fiber as a probiotic or, or a prebiotic, uh, we should say, um, the fiber can also be used to bind up different pathogens, particularly bacterial pathogens, shows a lot of success in bench top. But the problem is it doesn't always seem to translate through to when we actually feed the animal. And so we've been trying to explore, you know, why that's the case and also, you know, what's working and what's not working, um, in particularly in a, in a nursery pig where we see a lot of enteric challenges. Uh, we've also seen some interesting results in grow finished pigs when it comes more to um, Lasonia and Brachyspire, whether fibre works or doesn't work. And so we've done the gamut. Or, and working on the gamut of age and by disease and also with different types of fiber. So whether we're talking about fiber from, from wheat bran and wheat mids, from soy holes, from um, sugar beet pulp, from corn distillers, um, even from oat groats, the fiber comes in from oat groats. We've, we've been evaluating all of these in, in, in some practical diets and we yeah, are getting some different results and some things work and some things don't work. Yeah. So let's kind of start with maybe why they work or why they don't work that you found. So first of all, um, you know, fiber is not fibers you just alluded to, you know, which ingredient, which type it's coming from. And then also the individual characteristics, you know, around it as, as we drill down even to, you know, what's what's the individual sugar content. Right. So um, explain a little bit um, to our audience on what those different you know types are and analysis are and maybe what you've uncovered to date, Nick. Yeah, so typically when we think about fiber, um, at least from from the way we formulate diets, we're thinking more of it from a, a TDF standpoint, an NDF, ADF standpoint, because they're probably the easiest three to kind of measure, and, and then we can get individual ingredient analysis on them. But then also we're, we're, um, people have been moving more towards soluble and, and insoluble fiber assessments of ingredients, um, but there's a little bit more problematic in actually measuring and assessing those. Um, and so really probably NDF, TDF and ADF are the probably the big three. And then also now people are starting to break down more into, into specific um, non-starch polysaccharide kind of categories, but there's practical limitations to that because it, it's expensive to do and then you can't really analyse every single ingredient that you have in real time or in close to real time to actually get those um, get those numbers, and so um, I think that's been part of the challenges. And and then when we talk about success of fiber, um, we really want, um, we really need to define what we classify as success to be because fiber can you know for, for for success in certain situations it could be improved growth performance, but then you then if you have higher inclusion rates of dietary fiber, whether it's NDF, ADF, TDF even in soluble and soluble, then you can also start getting an impact on feed efficiency. And so, you know, therefore that may not necessarily be a metric of success for other people because there's a gut capacity aspect. Also, success could be measured in the sense of actually having um, reduced enteric health challenge or pathogen burden. Um, A lot of of fibre sources have been shown to bind up um, bacterial pathogens, particularly Himaliki coli's. Um, even have some success against some salmonella and also also they can displace other pathogens just through their kind of their probiotic effect. And so that can be a success, but then that may not necessarily translate through to a growth performance or a, or a kind of a, um, a performance benefit per se. Uh, the other thing is, is um, if we're feeding higher amounts of fiber where we can really drive you know, improvements in gut health, that also comes at the at the expense of where you're actually having an impact now on dressing percentage of the animal because you're improving visceral mass, but then you're you're actually offsetting carcass yield. So it's it's these trade offs that I think this is the nuances, um, and then also one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing is that when we compare say U.S. based diet formulations to Europeans, do you let energy float? Are you, or do you let it, or you fix it? And so I think you get very different answers if you kind of you let energy float versus you fix your energy and then putting more of the pressure on that fiber unit because um, and I think we need to consider the this differentiation between energy floating versus fixed with fiber inclusion rates to um, interpret some of this data. And so this is some of the challenges that we're trying to understand. 
Yeah, and as you mentioned, Nick, then when you throw in the extra factor of any health challenges or intake insults, both to the wean pig and the growing pig, right, that answer might change. Um, so maybe shifting a little bit to the growing pig, because you have done quite a bit of work there in terms of, you know, health by nutrition interactions, in terms of what's occurring, you know, to lean accretion, bone accretion, maybe highlight some of your work in, in your laboratories, um, you know, findings in terms of how um, nutrient and energy intake insults can affect lean accretion. Yeah, well, so at least on the fiber standpoint, what we're seeing is that um, if we're using fiber to dilute energy out of the diet, we do see that pigs eat to their energy needs, even if they're a health challenge. That's one thing. So pigs will try to eat to their energy needs. But then on the, particularly on enteric health, we see that making the diet more um, using dietary fiber or dietary carbohydrates that are more fermentable. And so you know, whether we're using resistant starches, a resistant potato starch, a class three resistant starch, or using sugar beet pulp, et cetera, which is more, they're more fermentable over say a wheat, a wheat bran, or even a yeah, corn distillers based fiber carbohydrate source actually improves pig growth rates during a swine dysentery or brachyspire challenge work. I mean, we did that work in collaboration with Dr. Eric Burrow and also um, John Plusky and others have shown that if you increase the fermentability of the diets, at least you're improving the, um, or you're decreasing the incidence, improving the health and performance of pigs that are actually um, challenged with swine dysentery. And so we see that. But then if you, uh, and then we also see that if we have high levels of, of corn distillers, um, in the diets, it actually is a predisposing factor to actually enhance the the chance of pigs actually expressing full disease when exposed to um, swine dysentery. But we, when we use the same diets, so in other words, we use more fermentable diets such as sugar beet pulp or resistant potato starch, etc., to actually increase fermentability. These diets aren't, aren't any benefit. We don't see any benefit of those diets when we're talking about Lasonia intracellularis. And so just because we improve the condition with one pathogen, we're not actually seeing the same benefit. We really don't see with Lasonia intracellularis, we don't see any benefit of, of changing the dietary fiber with regard to clinical disease incidence and performance of the pig. So at least in a grow finished pig, we're seeing that there's nuances between the particular enteric pathogen and that could be based to the, you know, based on the substrates that are that are being fed on by the microbiomes within these pigs, and also how these particular microbes actually, you know, where they like to colonize is probably going to be a, b- a big factor as well. One's more large intestine, and one's more small intestine. But there is nuances between that, so we can't say, you know, this fiber is good for enteric pathogens because we are seeing differences, at least in that grow finished pig. Um, on the nursery side, we've done a um, we've, we've done a, a fair bit of work now with with um, wheat bran, sugar beet pulp, um, wheat mids, oat groats, soy holes, and again, depending on the pathogenic enteric pathogen cocktail or burden that these pigs have, we seem to get different differing results, and it's not a clear picture, and it's it's frustrating because you're. You read the literature and say, oh, we fed, you know, sugar beet pulp and we see, yeah, this is the best thing since sliced bread in reducing hemolytic E. coli kind of burden in pigs. Well, we do that in commercial setting when we know these pigs have a positive for F18 um, ETEC, so toxigenic F18 E. coli. We don't see any benefit of wheat bran or beet pulp or any of these fiber sources that on a bench top they say are successful. And so why is that? And it's probably due to the fact that we're dealing with a in commercial pig where we've got a multifactorial enteric health burden. So we're dealing with rotavirus, we're dealing with underlying coccidia and salmonella issues as well as the as well as the hemolytic E. coli. And it's not a straight, you know, it's not a straightforward answer. And and then I think this is what's frustrating with the with this general area of research. But I think one of the things we are seeing that if we improve the fermentability of the diets, whether it's um, even with um, using a wheat bran or a sugar beet pulp, they are fermentable to different degrees. Over Depending on the duration post-weaning, we seem to have some beneficial effect, at least reducing some of the scouring and also some of the actual, um, some of the, at least the pathogen burden, but we're not seeing it translate really into a growth performance benefit. And so this is the trade-off. And the other frustrating thing about just fiber research in nursery pigs, at least in the US when we're dealing with 18 to 22-day, 23-day-old pigs, 
is that unlike Europe where they're more like 28 days of age or older, it's gut capacity is the biggest issue. If we need to get enough fiber in there to actually have a biological function, if, we have, if our pigs are only eating 50 to 100 grams of, of feed intake a day and you're got you, you, and then you're trying to get any you know, above four or five percent fiber inclusion rate or whatever fiber source, then then you're going against the actual gut capacity feed intake angle, and so it's a trade off. So because you probably need to be up around that eight to ten percent to have a, a true benefit. In what I'm seeing in these older pigs, you need to have you know higher inclusion rates, but then you can't get that in due to gut capacity in these newly weaned pigs at 21, 18 to 22 days of age. It goes against it. Yeah, and there's also dietary constraints, right? Because we're also trying to meet the needs, you know, for amino acids, energy, minerals, et cetera. There's only so much that you can put in the diet. So on that, Nick, you know, maybe thinking forward from a practical perspective and at the commercial level, do you think we might be more successful in terms of, you know, instead of modifying the diet and adding, you know, sugar beet pulp or resistant starch is, you know, say like a 50 pound or 100 pound inclusion and and what's that actually getting us, you know, in those first two starter diets? And so instead of doing that, you know, maybe having some type of top dress or pack, you know, that we're sending to each farm and, and we're trying to increase intake fiber that way without necessarily modifying um, the actual, you know, main diet. What are your thoughts on that, Nick? Um, yeah, so we're talking specifically more to nursery yeah, nursery. Yeah. So like today, for instance, you can buy resistant potato starch in a 50 pound bag. Yeah, I think there's, there's, oppo- there's opportunity to top dress. Um, you know, people, they use that as a drying agent in quite a few sour farms and, the, and then it turns into being uh, really a creep type feed at some point. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think there is opportunity to top dress, but I think the problem is getting enough of it into that first two weeks, two, three weeks post weaned is going to be the issue with a top dress. And so I don't think it's going to be viable, probably using fiber as a top dress in, if we're talking purely about the nursery pig. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing we've got to consider is, is that if we're trying to use fiber to reduce scouring and then at least pathogenic-induced scouring, disease-induced scouring, is we need to understand the timing of when that pathogen actually is. And so if we're trying to address a pathogen burden that's in the first two to three weeks post-weaning, we got to make sure that those pigs have enough um, digestive capacity to actually take in the diets that are going to have higher inclusion rates of fiber because I think from what we're typically seeing, we see pigs, once we get past the first three weeks post wean, that they, they're going to mow down that, that, you know, the, that third phase or fourth phase of diet. There's no problem with feed intake capacity and we see a lot of benefits enterically you know, with regard to intestinal morphology, intestinal health, et cetera. Yeah, in that kind of late in the second half of our nursery period. It's the first two, three weeks is where we have the problem, but then that's where we see our main pathogen burdens with rotavirus and, and F18 hemolytic E. coli, and it's just getting them on feed. And then in healthy pigs that do not have enteric challenges, that are going to be eating 250 to 400 grams a day in the first week post-weaned, we see a lot of success with fiber. You can feed whatever fiber source you like, at a you know at a relatively good inclusion rate of anywhere from four to seven eight percent, and then we see benefits of that. But then the problem is they haven't got the enteric pathogen burden that you're trying to mitigate with the fiber because they're healthy pigs. And so there's this trade off that it's that we're trying to figure out how to get around because they're not the pigs we need to feed the fiber source to. <laughs> it's, yeah. the, it's the ones that actually are enterically burdened is what we need to get in. And it's, just, it's, it's an age and an intake capacity it is the biggest issue. And so I think coming in, like um, if you could top dress or at least creep feed prior to weaning and start kind of manipulating the gut microbiome, et cetera, I think that's where there's a lot of good opportunities in that first two to three weeks post weaning because you're coming in early enough to fix it. Makes perfect sense. Um, Another factor as we talk about fiber, you know, whether it's the nursery pig or the finishing pig as well, is then, you know, what what type of enzyme inclusion and then type, you know, that we're going to use in combination with that fiber substrate, right? So we've had success stories and we've had frustrations and confounding results as well, Nick. So you want to talk about your, your experience with that in terms of, 
you know, or, or maybe just your thought process on, you know, once we get past maybe by taste and xylanase as we go to rabinin xylanase or beta mannanase, et cetera, on, on what approaches we should consider. Yeah, um, I think in nursery, if we're talking specifically to nursery pigs, my, my approach would be the more type of um, carbohydrates that we can put in, that cocktail is going to be more important than just a single enzyme. And I think the, the biggest issue, again, comes down to if we're talking about the first three weeks post-weaning, we don't really see, no matter, um, no matter you look at all the literature, what's been reported, you really very rarely see a lot of benefits of a single carbohydrate enzyme in the first three weeks. It's due to the fact that it's feed intake capacity and enough time for that, that fiber to be chopped up to make it more into you know, more soluble fractions, et cetera. But we see the benefits of using some of these technologies actually in the kind of weeks four to six post weaned where there's feed intake capacities there and then actually the pig is now mature enough to actually handle handle some of that stuff so it takes about two to three weeks for the gut microbiome to change to whatever diet's actually been fed and so if you put in a enzyme and you're expecting that enzyme to then modify lumen in the luminal environment modify that that carbohydrate or that fiber that's already there, and then by the time it actually gets um, gets working and then changes, then that, that fiber has been chopped up into its different fractions, into more NSPAs, you know, different types of NSPases, and then that then to work then as the prebiotic to then alter the gut microbiome, that test takes time. It's not something that you put in straight away and it works. Yeah, instantaneously. And so there's a timing aspect of it, and that's why we don't really see a lot of this happen early on in the first two weeks because of feed intake capacity and then the gut maturation is really occurring. But I think if the pig's got good feed intake there's a, and then they're using some sort of combination of probiotic and enzyme, a carbohydrates enzyme package, I think there's a lot of opportunity then to actually manipulate and improve fiber digestibility. And that's why we see they're always working, you know, the xylanases and so forth to see milk benefit and grow finish what you do in nursery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Let's pivot a little bit, Nick. So the other big product that you have at Iowa State is, of course, your students. Um, so you have graduate students underneath you. And, you know, in the past, um, you know, had a big undergraduate, um, you know, teaching appointment as well. So talk about a little bit about your graduate program um, and, you know, your student success is postgraduate as well. And if there's any of our listeners that are thinking about graduate program opportunities, uh, what they should consider and, and maybe how to reach out for opportunities in your laboratory or at Iowa State. Yeah, so I, I think, um, for, yeah, from a graduate program, at least from a graduate um, standpoint, right now I've got about, uh, I think, five or six graduate students um, three PhD, three master students uh, um, are in my lab. Um, part of the patients endowed professorship, the whole goal of that professorship was to continue training of students. So as such, um, yeah, that's what most of that endowment or all that endowment is actually used for, which is I'm being very grateful from the industry for supporting that because the whole idea is to put PhD students out into, out into the industry. Um so when it comes to graduate programs, I think the most important thing for students is to find a program where they um, have a uh, where they've got a direct interest or a question they want to answer. Um, they shouldn't just do grad school just for the sake of doing grad school. You got to do it because you want to build more skills, or you want to ask specific questions, or you got that that you got an um, acquisitive mind. You want to know how things work, or how to actually make make something better, or or understand the kind of nuances of interactions and so forth, with whether it's with diet or physiology of an animal or, you know, whatever your discipline is going to be. But find a program that actually you're going to like because when things don't work, we all have this in our, in our you know, PhD work where things don't work for weeks on end, you still got to roll out of bed and go in. And then if you don't like what you're doing, then it's very hard to do that. And and then we're seeing a lot more uh, mental health issues with the with the younger students coming through just in undergraduate and graduate programs. And so it's important to find a program that you're going to enjoy and going to like. That's the number one thing. Um, whether you do a program at Iowa State or anywhere else in the Midwest or around the world, everyone every program is slightly different and they all offer really good training on different disciplines. And so 
and even some on the same disciplines. It just depends on what you're really after. And so find a program. Uh, one of the biggest things, uh, one of the biggest issues that we have here in, in the, in, at least in the Midwest or in the US, is, is always finding enough funding to support students. And so a lot of the time it's just word of mouth um, or you apply for an open process and there's only limited seats. But I would encourage students, if they're interested in, um, in working with a faculty member, reach out to that faculty member and just send them a direct email or even just call them up and introduce yourself and then just talk about, you know, what they're doing or what you'd like to do and then just build a rapport with them and then see whether you can find a, a fit within that t- particular institution. And then, yeah, every institution is going to have a different way that their grad programs are handled. Um, we have one where people can apply, then we match them up with a professor, and then we bring them in based on that match. Others have, they apply, they can get in, rotate around, etc. But the important thing is you find the, find the program that's going to give you the skill sets that you want to do for your next step in your career. Yeah, good, great advice, and thanks for sharing that, Nick. So the next question is your plate's pretty full and you know, you've been named an endowed professor, uh, you're part of the, the Port Trust Consortium. Um, what else are you working on here over the next 12 months that our listeners can kind of uh, keep an eye on uh, for your, you know, your future presentations and also the work that your laboratory, laboratory is going to be producing here over the next year? Yeah, well, um, right now we're about a, uh... About three, four, three weeks out before Midwest Abstracts are due, so we're trying to pull Midwest Abstracts together. So our group will probably put in about I don't know, maybe 10 to 12 abstracts um, to that that um, we'll be responsible for. So some of that work, um, we've been doing a lot of work in um, Cal Fos, vitamin D, bone density area in the last two years. Um, part of that work is... We're trying to figure out, um, based on the on all the lameness work that's been done over the last probably three or four years, we're trying to figure out what is actual normal bone density for a pig because all the diagnostic labs don't really know what normal really is. And so we've been creating a data set for the last 12 months that um, that at different ages we, we kind of get an idea of the variability or what's kind of normal ranges of, of bone mineral density we would have on the on a pig. So we've but we've got a DEXA machine here, so we've been scanning um, whole pigs and then also pulling out the metatarsals or the fe- and the femurs, and so we've kind of got a couple of individual bones as well as whole body, and we're, um, we just want to create a data set to say this is the range that you get if you've got adequate phosphorus in your diet or deficient diet, phosphorus-deficient diets. This is kind of what the normal ranges would be from a, from a weaned pig all the way through to a market-age pig. So we'll have a probably a paper at the Midwest. We're looking, trying to pull that together to uh, on that. Um, other thing on the Kelfos side, um, every nutritionist I talk to cannot give me a straight answer of how to formulate or, or, on, or just give me a straight um, answer on how to best formulate calcium and phosphorus in the diet. Is it the ratio you go after? Is it available? Is it a standardized digestible? Is it total calcium? Is it available phosphorus? So one of my um, graduate students, um, Grace, she's actually part of her master's is to develop a training data set that we've looked at different philosophies with um, total calcium and available phosphorus, both looking at ratios and, and amounts, and then trying to figure out, well, if you, ha- if you have a certain philosophy with regard to total calcium or available phosphorus and different ratios, what are the outcomes with regard to bone density in a grower pig as well as actually growth performance and feed intake. And then we really want to use that more as a training set to say, well, if you have this philosophy, well, then, you know, this is what you're going to get. Or if you have this philosophy, then, you know, you might get this response. And so yeah, that's really you know, cool. um, interesting data set there. It was like a 20, a 20 treatment study that we did and all at the same time in the same genetics, the same health status. So therefore you can compare then across, across all 20 treatments and so really it was just like four titration studies in one. And so the idea is then you, know, you got fixed calcium at two different levels and then you get the same ratios of available phosphorus and then you got fixed available phosphorus at two levels and the same ratios. So we'll have that data set to present. Um, other stuff uh, we've been working on is more to do with um, still enter- enteric health side of things. And so... In the industry in North America, uh, America right now, there's a, um, been a lot of 
um, integrate. A lot of producers are actually feeding low crew protein diets for enteric health purposes, but really they're low lysine diets. And so to achieve a low crew protein, you know, below 18%, they're really just dropping their lysine curves from like a 1.375, 1.4, whatever you'd have at your starter down to a, down to 1.1, even a one, you know, 1.2, 1.1 range. And so what we've done is that Kayla Miller did some work here with, um, um, with this is that we wanted to see what the longitudinal impact was if you actually started, if you fed these enterically challenged nursery pigs, if you fed them these two diets, what's the long-term consequence at marketing of, of that? Because a lot of people say, well, they catch up. Okay, well, where's the data? There's no data to really agree or disagree with that. And if you are going to have these low accrued protein, i.e. low lysine curves, well, then you should be generating a pretty big difference by the end of your nursery period on those curves. And, you know, it could be, you know, 10-pound difference or it could be a 6-pound difference. But then does that, you know, what does that translate when you get up to 290 pounds? And so we'll have a data, we've got some data sets there that we'll share on that uh, on that consequence. And then, you know, these pigs had um, an F18 Himalik E. coli challenge with rotavirus and, and so forth. So we'll have some, some work there to present. Uh, other stuff is um, we'll have some stuff on E. coli attachment, looking looking at how F18 E. coli, like how it attaches and what does it mean to intestinal function integrity and related to genotyping of the pig. Um, Dr. Eric Burr at the vet school and myself have been working on ways to better quantify E. coli attachment. So we've got a in situ hybridization assay up and running where we can actually you now quantify it rather than just looking down a microscope and saying, yes, there's, yeah, there's more attachment or less attachment based on a kind of a rudimentary scoring system. We can actually now quantify that. Um, other work we're doing, let's see, uh, we'll probably put in some stuff on um, looking at uh, uh, vitamin D3 and 25-hydroxy titration curves. So another, just for nursery pigs, we're trying to understand, okay, well, with more and more 25 hydroxy products, 25 hydroxy D3 products on the market, well, um, you know, what's the requirement for a nursery pig if we're going to use 25 hydroxy versus a D3? And what's needed, or do we need to be, you know, do we need to be two or three times, five times higher than than what requirement really is, or you know, where do we sit? And so we'll we're going to try if we can get the data done in time, we'll try and have a, a data set in for Midwest on that. Um, other work, let's see what else we've got. Um, other work, there'll be some stuff to do with um, um, maybe so, some replenishment work where we actually had some pigs that were deficient in, in available phosphorus for periods of time, and then we looked at replenishment rates. And so how long does it take for that pig to, you know, catch back up to, um, to get full, back to full bone, bone mineral health? And so we have some data there. Um, there'll be some other stuff on uh, probably some soy hole work and also some soybean meal. And then the, probably the last studies that we'll do, we've just done, we're just completing some work where we're looking at trypsin inhibitor concentrations in pigs. And so for many years, we always hear trypsin inhibitor levels are bad. Okay, well, that's pretty, you know, generic. But then, you know, what is bad? It, what what do we what level what concentration of trypsin inhibitor do we need to have in a in a complete feed sample that a nursery pig or a growth finish pig is eating to actually have a negative impact on growth performance and feed efficiency? And so we've been doing some titration work um, with United Animal Health and also with um, the Mashoffs, Omar Mendoza at the Mashoffs and and Hari down at the USDA down in Missouri, and we're trying to figure out okay, well, where's the break point? Should we worry about if we have a soybean meal that comes in with a, a 9 or 10 TIUs per milligram and then we actually formulate the diet anywhere from 15 to 40%, you know, you're, you're, still going to be, you're still going to be below a 3 in complete feed. Well, do we have to worry about that? You know, so, and I think that's going to be very important to know where the break point actually is. And we really don't know. We just know that if we feed a lot of whole beans that has trypsin inhibitor, then we can cause problems. But what about with the bean meal or when we're down more, you know, below a you know, 10 or 12 in complete feed, it, where's the negative impact? Mm-hmm. So we'll have some of that work to present as well. Um, what else? There'll be probably some, maybe something on coccidia. 
There's, um, and then probably some stuff on some on some fiber as well. Looking at sugar beet pulp and and wheat bran. Yeah, now that's a that's a great set of abstracts. And you know, Nick and I we we've talked outside of this podcast, and I think every single one of those areas are either things that we have implemented and need verification um, within a controlled setting that yes, that is the correct strategy or we need to think more mechanistically about this right beyond a feed them and weigh them or just looking at close out data or that's questions that we have that we've maybe been a little hesitant about moving in that direction, but have at least thought about it. So um, I know for sure that I'm going to look forward to uh, seeing all those abstracts and presentations um, in Madison in March um, and hope our listeners are too, because that's really, really hitting some um, um, issues squarely. Um, or at least it seems like uh, uh, at least an, from my perspective or our system, at least. So um, kudos, Nick, that that's a very intriguing set. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity just to really revisit a lot of requirement type stuff just within the pig with the modern genetics. Now there's not a lot, I mean, they're looking at updating the new NRC, I mean, updating the 2012 NRC and some of these other pro, uh, other you know, requirement resources but then i think a lot of requirement studies haven't been done so i think that's where there's a lot of opportunity and with with the higher lean growth pig these days you know are things changing well they may not and what we're seeing is that a lot of the stuff that we're, what we've been doing that the nrc is pretty darn accurate in predicting a lot of a lot of break points so and then on the fiber side, I think there's a lot of opportunity on, on the fiber side, but with fiber, I think we just need to start putting, you know, breaking it down to more being more nuanced for horses for courses or age of the pig and rather just using it as a blanket. And then the whole satiety satiation aspect that's very good for sows and the reason why we want to use it for sows or gilt is, is probably the opposite reason for what we want to use it for grow finished pigs and we got to think about it differently. And then how do we make it fiber more functional for whatever that purpose is? And the purpose in a, in a newly weaned pig is more for enteric health and reducing enteric burden of pathogens. Well, that might be a little bit different than if we want to use it to you know, make the diet cheaper or, or just if it's readily available, how do we better incorporate it to then not lose dressing percentage? It's a, they're totally different questions and we need to start breaking that stuff up. And then... Yeah, in the Midwest, our fiber sources are, are very limited in the sense that yeah. we're, you know, we're taking corn and soybeans, maybe some wheat and then and maybe some oat sources. <laughs> but then it's not cost effective to use a lot of the fiber fiber sources that yeah, Europe and Australia and Asia has access to because we just can't get them. And so we're limited. And then it's got to be economical. And so when we formulate fiber in the diets, we've got to think about the cost of it. And then we don't want to be pulling out a lot of energy out of the diet because we're putting more fiber in and then having to put all of that energy back in, put all the fat back in. It doesn't make economical sense for us over here. Correct. And so the only way we're going to use a lot of fi- increase our fiber utilization is if we let energy flow. Otherwise, it does not make economical sense. And this, you know, this new, these nuances make a big, big difference on how you interpret the data. And we need to consider all this stuff. And these are the challenges that we're trying to deal with. Or well, you deal with this every day. I don't. <laughs> yeah. No, and it, it, once again, when you, you throw in that health nutrition interaction with, with fiber, you know, if you let energy flow, right, if you're formulating on an SID lysine to energy level, right, you know, if your energy decreases, you know, your lysine and corresponding amino acids are going to decrease as well, right? So, you know, it's, um, it's a multifactorial problem that you're trying to solve, on a system-wide basis or at least a feed mill or a flow basis, right? And there's variation within a, a pen of pigs, let alone a barn of pigs and then a flow of pigs and then a system of pigs. Um, so yeah, you're, you're trying to do as best as you can. So yeah, so, so thanks for helping us lead us in a better direction, Nick. I know I appreciate it and I'm sure our listeners do too. Well, we're slowly trying to find answers, slowly. But yes, <laughs> that's the cha- that's the fun and the challenge of, of research, and especially if we try to make it commercially applicable, it's even it's even more exciting. But it's yes. also more frustrating because it's not as clean cut. Yes, yeah. But but one thing that you do really well, and your graduate students do well as well, is you try to find the mechanism reasons for why or why not, versus then you know, hey, we we fed these diets, we weighed them, here's the response. And then we repeated this three or four times and found three or four different answers, but we're not sure why 
you know, we came up with, with different responses. Um, we know there's different, you know, um, environments or maybe health tests or what is, but that, that's about it. So being able to not only have commercial applicable research, but try to find some mechanism reasons for why that response, um, you know, or why that outcome was generated within that data set helps us on our end make decisions in the field every day. So, so thank you for that direction um, and that, that approach, Nick. Yeah, and I think a lot of that comes back to age of the pig, feed intake capacity, and also where is that, where are those carbohydrates, that fiber being broken down, and where are those fermentation products? Because if you've got problems in the small intestine and you're trying to improve in small intestinal health, well, then if you've got all your fiber being fermented in the cecum and colon, not a lot of that butyrate or that, you know, those metabolites are going to go back and actually help the small intestine with the maturation aspect. And therefore, we're not helping kind of speed up maturation and, and gut health per se, whatever, you know, that loose term there in that first couple of weeks. And Bingo. we're helping with the hind gut, but not with necessarily the foregut. But then that's where all the rotavirus is and all the hemolytic coli is going to be primarily attaching. And so... A worldwide leader in animal nutrition. Adiseo's portfolio of products includes methionine, the full range of vitamins, enzymes, organic selenium, probiotics, mycotoxin management strategies, and palatability products. With such a diverse offering, Adiseo supports its customers with a broad range of expertise, tools, and services to help them maintain a competitive advantage. Adiseo, fueling predictable profits. To learn more, visit Adiseo at www.adiseo.com. It's time for our famous three. Eastman serves veterinarians and nutritionists in agrochemical and animal health industries by helping them select, evaluate, and implement innovative nutritional programs. Eastman works with your team to customize your gut health approach in feed and water. Eastman's approach addresses nutritional and bacterial challenges and finds new ingredient preservation and hygiene solutions. Explore ways to accelerate and innovate your programs. Contact the animal nutrition team at eastman.com. Awesome. Well, I try to end every podcast on kind of four different questions, Nick. Um, so we'll go ahead and go through these here. Uh, the first is you're a native Australian and we're coming up on the holiday season. So what's your favorite Australian tradition that you ensure that you celebrate here stateside with your family? Uh, favorite tradition, I'd say... Um Christmas time, you just do a, do a Christmas pudding. So like a steamed pudding, that's more of a plum raisin based pudding. That'll be the one of the favorite you know, Christmas traditions. It's actually better over here because it's actually cold rather than, I mean, rather than being in 90 degrees, 90, 100 degrees back in Australia. Well, you're not going to take a swim here stateside, you know, after Christmas dinner, right? <laughs> yeah, that'll be the, that, that's the thing. But yeah, I, I like, um, yeah, like making sausage rolls or meat pies or stuff like that. Just some of the comfort foods back from Australia. Nice. Uh, what's the biggest hurdle that you've overcome that you're the most proud of, Nick? Uh, the biggest hurdle was probably um, having to slow down speaking so people could understand me when I first got here. Because <laughs> the, the accent softened, but that was a hurdle because uh, people couldn't understand me. Uh, I, think, I think the biggest research hurdle is actually – you learn more from your mis learning to learn more from your mistakes than if something mm -hmm. always works. And we've learned more from our mistakes. We've done lots and lots of health challenge by nutrition studies and the body of work every time we're learning something new, even though we may not get a, you know, the a result that's significantly different and so forth, but learning to un embrace the, the stuff that doesn't necessarily work or you reject your hypothesis on that takes, it's just taken time to, to kind of understand and embrace that. And then over time, you, you look back and say, oh, gee, look at the path that we've, we've done. Like we started off this nutrition by health stuff 12 plus years ago. And every time we're, you know, if we look back, look back now, we started off with PERS and then we've moved through with PED. We've done stuff with um, Lasonia, with Brachyspire, with, with um, Salmonella, with Hemolic E. coli. Yeah, all these we're learning something new about every every different pathogen, but just in, just embracing the stuff that doesn't work, and the mistakes that you make in the lab, and even just um, being more patient as a professor and realizing that yeah, I got to trust my graduate students or my students that they I got to give them opportunity to make mistakes for them to get better. 
And then I can't, you know, you, you can't get upset with them if they make a mistake because we're a learning institution and you, they're going to learn more from making that mistake. Hopefully they don't make it, but they're going to learn more from that than um, if everything is just kind of cookie cutter and, and succeeds for them. And so just being patient and actually learning learning to embrace, the, you know, the, the um, outcomes of whatever that research is or the mistake is and then moving forward has been, um, I'd say it's been a big hurdle because you want everything to work all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's good. Uh, what's your favorite pork recipe, Nick? Pork recipe? Um, you can't beat a, um, just a plain old Iowa chop. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just a plain old chopper. But otherwise, uh, pork recipes, I, I like um, ground pork. I really enjoy eating ground pork. So make it, making a ground pork into like a pork sausage, put in a sausage roll, which is just a kind of ground pork with herbs and eggs and kind of um, breadcrumbs, mix it all up, then you stuff it into a pastry and bake it. Awesome. I really like that. Um, and then also just um, ground pork just in like a – Asian lettuce wraps and stuff like that is really nice. So that would be my go-to, ground pork and then a pork chop. Nice. And then lastly, if you could answer one of your research questions today, which one would you pick and why? Uh, I think the biggest research question I'm trying to answer is why don't these weaned pigs at 19, 20, you know, 18, 22 days of age, why don't they want to eat? Why can't we get them to eat? We put all the flavorings, all the olfactory sensory aspects in, in them, but why don't they eat? And, yeah, you see the same thing with heat stress. You see the same thing with other disease states. Is under, I think we need to understand what's going on up in the hypothalamus that regulates appetite and satiation. But un, if we can understand the brain aspect of it, not necessarily what the, the gut-brain axis, but actually the hypothalamus that controls all this, I think we can unlock a lot of lot of things to get these pigs to eat, and I think that's the ultimate question: is how do we unlock? How do we understand the brain more and appetite regulation at the brain? Because then that also ties into energy metabolism and so forth. But it's really you look at the literature. There's nothing. There's virtually nothing out there with regard to appetite regulation at the brain. We hear about all the gut brain axis, and we hear a lot of a lot about um, neuropeptides that are in the bloodstream and expression in intestinal tissues but then what are they doing what's the signaling aspects in the brain if we can unlock that i think it it, it will prove pig livability or reduce antibiotic use it will um, improve just general health and performance well-being of the animal and then also on the on the flip side of the coin we'll understand more about appetite regulation to help with when we want to manage weight with regard to gilts and sows and so forth and then we can understand more of that signaling pathway. So that's the that's my ultimate research question for the last couple of years. We've been slowly chipping away at that. I really would like to crack that nut. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks for your time, Nick, and uh, thanks for you for listening to this episode of the Swinet Podcast. I hope you enjoy other of our episodes that will be coming out here shortly. Hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>